program with the wonderful world of Disney or the Ed Sullivan Show. He graduated from David Lipscomb University, where he took credit to daily Bible courses for four years, including upper division religious studies. He ran the Sunday School program for the inner city church in Nashville and occasionally delivered sermons for ministers in small outlying churches. Gary is a trained tax attorney. He eventually became president of financial services company in San Diego, California, until the company was sold. He is now a corporate vice president with New York Life Insurance Company. Gary sets personal goals each year uh, to learn something new and out of his comfort zone. This annual quest has led him to captain a sailboat to Mexico, learn to play the guitar, Maybe we could bring that next week. <laughs> Hiked 150 miles in the Sierras, complete two triathlons in a year, swim the La Jolla Rough Water Race, write a screenplay and a stage play, complete, compete in 40 fencing bouts, write 20 songs, read the entire Bible, the Quran, the primary portions of the Hindu uh, Bhagavad Gita, and the Buddhist Pali Canon, and engage in a number of other activities, which I'll tell you about next week. Um, he is also an active member of Mensa. Please help me welcome Gary Underwood. Kind of embarrassed now. I mean, uh, that's, that's one of those things that they send uh, when you're uh, at, at work, and uh, I sent it to him. I just didn't want to know what he wanted. But uh, thank you very much for the warm introduction there. Um, Today, uh, I, I want to thank you so much for being here today. Today we're going to talk about the New Testament canon and how the final books were chosen and why so many of the books that early Christians loved so much were excluded because there were a whole lot of books, a lot of different communities out there, and those, those uh, many of the books were excluded. When you talk about New Testament canon studies, you're really discussing four major questions, and that is why did the canon take centuries to develop? Um, what standards were used for inclusion in the canon, what, who applied these standards and, and as to which of the books and decided which of the books were canonical, and what effect did these books uh, that were excluded from the Old Testament and the New Testament, what effect did those books have on Christianity in the long run? Because they did have a very powerful effect. A lot of Christians refused to give them up for, for centuries after that, actually, they continued to read them. Okay, now these are some of the New Testament books that didn't make it. There's only, uh, there's only 40 here, but there really were more. As you can see, there were many Gospels, the Gospel of Bartholomew, uh, Nazarenes, the Egyptians, the secret Gospel of Mark. Uh, there were many infancy Gospels. There were many Acts of the Apostles here. Uh, there were many other types of things, uh, other epistles uh, and things like that. The ones you see in red, First Clement, Shepherd of Hermas, uh, and Episcopal of Barnabas, uh, they were actually included in our oldest Bibles. The Codex Sinaiticus uh, included uh, both uh, the Shepherd of Hermas and the Episcopal Barnabas. And uh, the, the second oldest, the Vaticanus, which is owned by the Vatican, they have it right there in the Vatican, uh, included also, in addition to those two, included the Book of Clement. Now, I'm going to give a very brief overview, kind of give a, a general, I know timelines really bore people, but. Uh, but I'm going to give a very brief overview of where some of this information fits over four centuries because the development of the canon really was a kind of a four century process and it's still subject to debate today. I mean, there are still people that want to add things to the canon even to this day um, because they believe the Holy Spirit still operated and could operate to, to, to add things to it. Uh, you have to remember the Septuagint, right? We all we had a lesson on that. The Septuagint is the um, Greek translation of the Old Testament that included um, the Apocrypha, and it was very heavily relied on on these people here to write the New Testament. Ninety-five percent of all the uh, Old Testament verses that are quoted are from the Septuagint language, not the Masoretic text uh, that, that the rabbis talked about when they were here uh, a few weeks ago. Now, we kind of start with the death of Christ around 30 A.D. Apostle Paul starts writing the, script, uh, the epistles between 44 and 66 uh, or so. And Paul dies between 66 and 68. And then this traumatic event happens to all of Christianity, all of the Jews, 
is the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Many of the people that Christ knew died in that, that Roman invasion. I mean, they hunted down everybody. They either put them in slavery, unless you uh, didn't like Josephus and join them, they either put them in slavery or put them to death or many, many horrible things that were in the diaspora. They were uh, dispersed all over the place. And so a lot of these people, that, that made a real strong impetus to, hey, we've got to write down some of these oral stories because everything from the death of Christ to here, that 40-year period, has been oral stories about Jesus. And we'll tell why that's the case in a few minutes. So they started writing down these stories. Mark was the first right around 70 A.D. Matthew and Luke came later. John was about between 90 and 100. First Clement was written and was almost included in our Bible by one of the earliest of the apostolic fathers. He, he apparently, uh, he supposedly knew uh, the apostle Peter and, and Peter chose him. We don't know that for a fact from the Bible, but his writings are incredible. I've read First Clement and, his, and he's right down the line when it comes to Christian doctrine. Uh, so this apostolic father here and this apostolic father here are two very important people in the early development of the church because he's the one that uh, basically says the same thing. It is very important for our studies. Ignatius is the one that says we need to have one bishop per city. Now that kind of conflicts with the way we view things, but he was very strong about that. There should be one major bishop per city. And we'll explain why that was uh, important to the development of the canon also. <clears throat> now in the second century, uh, we have a lot, of, mainly what we know, okay, about the development of the canon is what comes from the writings of the apostolic fathers. And um, we call them the apostolic fathers, but you understand what I mean. Like they're, they're early Christians, and the Catholic Church called them the apostolic fathers. They usually were elders in churches. They could read and write, which put them a real minority of people at that time. Um, and so they usually served as, as elders in their churches or bishops in their churches. Um, but they were great Christians. They had, they, I mean, they really stuck to the uh, Christian doctrine. But they had great differences, too. Uh, Papias, he didn't, he didn't even like using the Bible quite so much. He liked the oral tradition better. Uh, Marcion was the first person to create a canon. Okay? But his canon consisted of just some of Paul's letters and um, part of the book of what we think is Luke. He didn't call it Luke, but we think it's Luke. And he was a Gnostic. Uh, I'm sorry. He wasn't really a Gnostic, but he had beliefs that were very similar to Gnosticism. And um, he was later ruled heretic. But the problem with, with Marcion is he, he wouldn't accept anything that was Jewish. He says, Paul has got the way. He's the Messiah. It, he, he's divine. And uh, anything that's Jewish, we don't want the Old Testament at all. We don't need it. It's the old law, and it was, uh, it was bad. So um, most of the apostolic fathers disagreed with this. Uh, Polycarp starts talking about um, authoritative writings. But the big controversy comes with Irenaeus, who says, look, we need to stop this stuff. We need to start deciding what books we are going to use. And I'm going to start with the Gospels. And I'm saying there's four Gospels. I'm saying there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's it. Well, the theologians say, no, you're wrong. John is a Gnostic gospel. We're not going to accept it. And they were later branded as heretics by the, by the Catholic Church for saying that. And then Clement of Alexandria comes of just a few years later. Uh, he's the very, very powerful, probably the second most powerful bishop, second to the bishop in Rome. And he says, no, Irenaeus, you're wrong. Um, as a matter of fact, there's some other gospels that need to be added to the four gospels. So by the end of the 200s, we don't even know which Gospels are the ones that are supposed to be there. Uh, they, everybody pretty much agrees on the epistles of Paul, but they, uh, they don't all accept the pastoral epistles and, and Revelation, especially Revelation is the most controversial of the books. This here is the oldest fragment that we have of the, of the New Testament. I, I always love this because I've seen this. I was in the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian did a special thing where they actually showed, uh, brought in parts of the Codex Sinaiticus, and it was a, a one-time showing uh, over the century or something. They brought in all these Bibles from, from the world. Uh, this is about 2005, I think it was. And it, I, I went there, and I was in there for like four hours one day and four hours the next. I just couldn't leave the place. And this is the earliest uh, fragment uh, that we have the New Testament. It's from the book of John, and it's the part where Jesus says, everyone who hears who is of the truth, hears my voice. 
and and uh, and Pilate said to him, Pilate, what is true? And so you know, it's that 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 kind of conflict that you got there, and it's in that old scripture that we got it. It's just kind of funny, I thought. Okay, let's skip another. Well, in the third century, we still don't have a centralized church. We don't have we have very vast differences among Christians. There's many different books that are being read among the Christians, and the canon's not firmly developed yet. The canon, the closed canon, hasn't happened yet. Uh, our two greatest scholars during this period, not much changes. Uh, Tertullian or, on Origin were probably two of the greatest scholars that ever were biblical scholars. They did incredible things, uh, like create the Hexla, which was, you know, six versions of the Old Testament from the Greek to the Hebrew and everything all the way down. In, at 15 years of work just for that one work that Orange, uh, Origen did. But he thought new Christians should begin with Judah, Tobit, the wisdom of Solomon in the Old Testament Apocrypha, uh, before proceeding with Psalms, and then the Gospels. But don't read Leviticus, he said. He said, that's too hard. They don't need to be reading that. So uh, he had this little thing there. <laughs> Anybody here read Leviticus? Let me tell you, it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. So I would probably agree with that part of it. I think I'd link Leviticus to the very, very end of everything. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next one. Well, things really start to change in the 4th century. Because in the 4th century, we have over here, I'm standing in front of some people's way, maybe I'll stand over here. We have the, um, the uh, persecution by Diocletian. And I don't know if you had this. Did they see the reading material? There's some reading material? You didn't get any reading material for this, right? Okay. Yeah, there, there, there's a, uh, there's actually some reading material that talks about this. But during this, this um, um, persecution by Diocletian, he was forcing Christians to give up their books. And he said, you will die or give up your books. Well, a lot of Christians had to decide. Well, let me see. I've got the Apocryphon of John here, and I've got the book of Matthew. Which one am I willing to die for? I might be given this and keep this and get away with it, right? So some of them were having to make decisions, but they did disagree over which ones were the ones that were willing, they were willing to die for. But all of a sudden, Constantine comes into the picture. He's the great emperor of Rome. Uh, he stops religious persecution. He calls the Council of Nicaea and says, look, I want all you Christians to, to start settling on these doctrines. You all believe these different things. I want you to start settling. And then he orders 50 Bibles from Eusebius, the, the, the big uh, bishop and one of his best friends, the, the bishop at Caesarea. He says, I want 50 Bibles. That's like, that's like a $25 million project in today's terms because everything was written by hand. I mean, it was very expensive to get a complete Old Testament with the pocket for with the New Testament scriptures completely written on parchment that's goat skin that has to be treated and stretched and treated for a year before you can even start writing on it. I mean a big big project to create a Bible like that. But you say because his problem is he says, well I don't know which ones to put in, you know, because here's the ones that we know and here's the ones that we're not sure about and here's the ones that are disputed and here's the ones we know we shouldn't put in. Uh, but it was not, what he ended up making was a, a, a canon similar to ours, but not exactly the same. Finally, in uh, Bishop of Athanasius, he used 27 books in 367 AD that matches exactly our uh, New Testament. Now, he did include the Apocrypha of the Old Testament, but our New Testament is the exact same 27 books. But the Council of Carthage comes back in, in 397 and says, well, Athanasius, you know, we like it, but we're excluding Revelation. We don't think it's inspired. It needs to be out. Next slide. But what happens 20 years later? Revelation's in. <laughs> so they include, they say, we change your mind, we're going to put Revelation in. But the Syrian, remember the, 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 uh, the Catholic Church and the early church in the Mediterranean was not really the only church. There were the Syrian Christians uh, at this time, they produced some of our best Bibles, as a matter of fact. They're beautiful. I saw them in the, in the Smithsonian. I have a whole book of them, uh, pictures of them, uh, that the, uh, the Syrians did. But they did exclude Revelation, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, and Jude, because they did not think they belonged in the canon. And I, I think that's true even to the day, if I'm not mistaken. This is Codex Sinaiticus. This is the oldest complete Bible that we have. And uh, it's absolutely beautiful. I just wanted you to see it because when you take the, in the Smithsonian, they actually take some pages out and put it up before the light so you can see through it. 
and see where they write and make the little changes and stuff in it. And it's just absolutely a beautiful, it's really a beautiful work of art. It looks kind of old and dingy there, but it's, but it's really not. Well, let's move up to the last five centuries and see if there's any canon stuff that's going on. Well, Martin Luther, he starts the Protestant Reformation, what, 1517, 1519? Anybody know which year that? One of the two. It's one of the two. 1517, I think. And when he starts the Protestant Reformation, he wants to remove Revelation, Hebrews, James, and Jude. I'll read next week some of the things he has to say about Revelation, for example. But, and he takes the Apocrypha out of the Old Testament and puts it in his own separate section. But he, after he starts to do it and thinking about taking those out and putting them in their own section, he goes, he does put them all at the very end, but he says, uh, I don't want a canon fight in addition to the Protestant Reformation, so let's not, let's leave that to a later date. Well, the Council of Trent hears about this. It's the Catholic Council, and they say, no, 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 we're going to pass something formal. This is the formal Bible. It's got the Apocrypha, and it's got the whole 27 books, and Martin Luther's wrong. Well, the King James Version comes out in 1611. They separate the Apocrypha out, just like Luke, Luther, into a separate section. And they keep the Apocrypha up until 1826, and the King James Version throws it out. And we have, uh, you know, we don't have the Apocrypha in, the, in our current King James Version after 1826. Uh, the Vatican approves uh, additions to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. You know the story about the woman taken into adultery, uh, and Jesus says, he's without sin, cast the first stone. Well, that, that's not included in the earliest versions uh, of the book of John. He doesn't include, doesn't actually happen until about the 5th or 6th century. So all of the Vatican's old books didn't include that, and so as a result, they don't have that story in, in the book of John. So they decide to include it. Well, in 1949, the Revised Standard Version, the, the Protestants, their version, they take the story out. Same story that they put in, they take the story out and put it in the footnote and say, this is not early witnesses. Well, it upsets so many ministers across the country, they put it back in in the next edition. So, um, which is good, because I think it's a, great, it's a great thing. And some scholars want to add the Gospel of Thomas to this day. So as you can see, most of it was settled by the, settled by, um, I guess you could say it was settled by the end of the fourth century, but we still have people, uh, new discoveries that are being made, the discoveries of Nag Hammadi and, and uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls have changed our perception of how, how some of these things work. Okay, um, well, let's talk about why the, why the canon selection took uh, centuries. Now, few people could read. Early authority was oral and not textual. Early authority was apostolic. Uh, uh, early Christians expected Christ to come soon, so a lot of them didn't see a reason for writing things down because they expected him to come very soon after his death. There was great diversity in the early church that made universal agreement on the canon difficult. And there was a process for finalizing the canon uh, the, the process didn't exist. You know, all these independent bishops I was telling you about, well, they were pretty much in control of their own little churches there, in Alexandria and whatever, and there wasn't anything for unifying them. And so they weren't going to agree with Alexandria guy. If you were in Caesarea and you thought this was it, well, I'm sorry, you do what you want to do. We're doing what I'm saying we're doing here. So there wasn't a very decentralized. You had a lot of Gnostics still out there. Now, a few people could read or write. Now, remember, in the ancient world, a city that was the most educated, like Athens, would have 5 to 15 percent of the people in there that could, could read or write at the best. Some of them only had 1 or 2 percent that could read. Okay? So, if you were in one of those churches and you could read or write, I mean, you were important. You were probably going to be made bishop or one of the bishop's assistants or presbyters or something. Because just the fact that you could read or write, you're going to be up there at Sunday morning every night, every morning, reading the scriptures because you can read and write, and you were probably making copies for other people and probably trying to teach them to read. Uh, there were no printing presses; scriptures hard to obtain. It takes you ever tried writing out the entire Bible long yet? <laughs> <laughs> long time. Now, also, early authority was oral; it was not textual. Now, when Jesus had not written any, anything himself. He did not tell the apostles to write anything. He told them to teach. He made them the great commission to go out and teach everybody. Now, it's obvious the Holy Spirit came on the apostles and, just, and told them, hey, it's time to start writing stuff, right? 
But um, at this time, uh, the people that heard Jesus and the early Christians, they didn't hear anything about writing. They thought the, the Old Testament was what really was what the, the, the key scripture. And that any new writings weren't necessarily going to be forthcoming because he never predicted it. Now, early Christians basically spread the gospel orally, talk orally to each other. This is what I heard Jesus say. This is what he said on the Sermon on the Mount. And the people that knew Jesus the best, of course, the apostles, told the most. They went all over the place telling people, and other people told other people. They, they, they did have some textual context, and that is they looked at the Old Testament as Scripture. And they really did consider it as Scripture. Okay? Even, even Clement considered it as Scripture. He considered it actually superior to the writings of Paul. <coughs> first. That's the indications of the writing. Uh, it had, writings of Paul had not quite elevated to the importance of the Septuagint as Scripture. Um, the Old Testament stories were basically read in a very different way, though. They didn't look to it for the law because Paul said the law was gone, right? They looked to it for the allegorical proof that Jesus was coming. Like the story of the Red Sea, okay? Going through the Red Sea. The Israelites going through the Red Sea. Jesus went into the grave, and he comes out on the other side, risen again, a new person. Uh, Christians go into the baptism of water, and they come out newborn again. That, this was all an allegory. This didn't really happen. This is an allegory of the coming uh, Christian movement. Oh, that's what a lot of these people believe. Um, and so they, they, no Christians observed all the Mosaic law, for example. They, most of the things they quote from is from Psalms and Isaiah, not the, you know, the, the Torah, for example. Now, uh, the first apostolic father, this is a picture of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Clement being put to death, by, by the way. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a great Christian. I mean, the things I, I've read, you can tell how, how wonderful his Christianity was. But he was uh, put an anchor put on his uh, hands, and he was thrown overboard and drowned. Uh, and that's what the, that picture represents. Uh, they were doing to but the first one, he reserved the scripture uh, for the Septuagint. He knew the Pauline letters. He knew the words of gospel of, the, of Jesus, but he never calls the gospels by the names that we call them, uh, because you know they're actually written. They don't really. I mean, we get the. Names Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John from people a little bit later. They never claimed to be written by those people in the actual books themselves. They're really written anonymously. So while uh, Clement valued these very highly, he said these are great, he never really refers to them as scripture. That's a little bit later that you start seeing that, and he died in 99 AD. Now, the oral tradition still begins with the, the destruction of. Uh, uh, begins to change with the destruction of Jerusalem. You know, oral tradition been very strong at the destruction of Jerusalem, but then they wanted to start writing things down. And uh, but even as late as 120, pa uh, Papias, the one of the apostolic fathers, says, you know, I don't get as much from the books as I do from the voice that remains, the oral tradition, the Holy Spirit made, is what he was talking about. But that's uh, he really thought the oral tradition was still uh, very important. A third thing that why it took things so long to develop is that early authority was apostolic. Divine authority had been given to Jesus by the apostles, and the apostles passed on this authority to the new Christian leaders, presumably the bishops, according to a lot of the apostolic fathers. Ignatius of Loyola of Antioch, uh, I'm telling you, it really it kind of disturbs me a little bit because this is the first century. This is like this is like within. Uh, 40 years after, after uh, 30 years after, um, after Paul's dead, you know, it happens pretty quickly. He says he actually writes in his epistle to the Ephesians. Plainly, therefore, we ought to regard the bishop as the Lord Himself. That's how much authority they're giving these bishops in each of these churches. Take care to do all things with harmony with God, with the bishop presiding in the place of God. So the bishop had tremendous power in these early churches. And uh, this is kind of a, a kind of disturbing a little bit to see how much power they got. I think in a lot of the outline churches, they did not have that power. They certainly didn't have it in the Gnostic churches. They certainly didn't have it in the, in the churches that Andrew set up around Thrace and, and uh, Black Sea and places like that. But in the Mediterranean, they got, uh, we have a lot of proof to show this is what was happening. If God's authority, uh, now this, uh, Richard Simon said, well, not Richard Simon, a lot of the Christians, the reason they didn't look to the text so much 
is that if God's authority on earth is the bishop, then why is the text so important? Hmm. You know? So that's kind of a kind of a flash in the water, in the face, isn't it? If that's the case. Richard Simon said that God, that, hey, look, he was a Catholic guy that fought Martin Luther, right? He said, look, the earliest texts that God inspired are gone, and our texts are full of change. If God wants to have the original words, he would have saved them. So that's proof right there. It's no harder to save them than to inspire them in the first place. That's proof that God wanted the authority on earth to be a bishop and not the Bible. Mm -hmm. So what's our answer to that? I, I don't believe it for a second. Do you? No, no, no. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. What's our answer? I'll tell you what, let's look at Philippians. Let's see how much of that we can find in the book of Philippians. Let's see here. Philippians um, chapter 2, verses 12 to 13. I'll truncate it a little bit. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for God is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do I need a priest stepping in between me and God? No. No, we don't believe that, right? So um, anyway, that was their view of it, but um, you know, that's one of their arguments. So. Christ was coming soon. There's no, there's no need for a king. Now, there were some things in the, in the New Testament and in Paul's writings that made it appear that Christ would be coming soon. For example, I tell you that when Jesus says in Matthew, I tell you the truth, some standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. We now know that means the church, right? But at the time, people thought it was going to be the thing, the second coming. And, uh, you know, these people did taste death. Uh, they all tasted death before that time. The appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even though who have wives be as though they had none. Don't have any kids. Okay, this is this is a Apostle Paul talking to his people. For the present form of this world is passing away. Now I'm not sure if that was meant just for the Corinthians, because they were pretty unruly group, you know. <laughs> so who knows? But um, the, the point that I'm making is that a lot of people interpreted these things as saying, look, Jesus is coming soon. Why do we need a text? You know? But after the destruction of Jerusalem, I said, you know, maybe we need, to need these texts. So they started really devoting a lot of time to the text. Here's the really big problem, and that is the great diversity in the early churches that happened um, that made you know, the universal canon difficult. Remember, the basic tenet of Christianity. All men are condem condemned to death by sin. Jesus, the Son of God, died for your sins. He is the perfect atonement. Believe in Jesus and you shall receive eternal life. Now that is the basic message that went out everywhere. And people loved it. It was true. It, it, it got to people's hearts. But guess what? A simple message like that believed to open a whole lot of other questions, doesn't it? Like, what is the nature of God? What's the nature of the relationship between Jesus and God? What is this thing called the Holy Spirit? What's heaven like? What's hell like? Um, what is the Old Testament's relationship to our current, current thing? This basic thing that you need to have for salvation doesn't answer all those questions. So people brought up a lot of different questions like that, and then they started saying, well, we don't really agree with you. Now, I'm not, I, I think one of the lessons that you can get from that is that Christians can believe different things and maybe still be saved. I don't know what God's going to do. He may just say, well, you know, I know you believe this, but guess what? You still believed in Jesus, so all your bad beliefs are forgiven. I don't know. But uh, hopefully, hopefully that we, we follow the best, the best way, the way that we can. Now look at these, these early Christian groups here. These were all early Christian groups. Adoptionists, Nazarenes, Serenthian Gnostics, Capricotian Gnostics, all of these. I'm going to go through these very, very quickly because uh, we don't have time to go through. The Adoptionist Christians, for example, uh, Jesus, there are a whole lot of groups of Adoptionist Christians. They believe Jesus was the perfect man, but there was no, and, and God adopted, adopted Jesus as his son at baptism. Uh, there's no virgin birth, there's no pre existent. But Jesus was the perfect uh, atonement for sacrifice. Some scholars actually think that Mark and Paul reflect this view because they never talk about the virgin birth. And um, yeah, I don't, who knows? They, they didn't write about it. <laughs> they might have talked about it a lot. You know, so I don't know if that has any, any credence at all. Uh, many early Christians uh, 
did hold this view, though, especially Jewish Christians. Uh, Enonite Christians, they were, this is one of the early little books that was recently found within the last five or six years, I think. Um, uh, the Enonites, they used an early form of Matthew that we no longer have. They believe in the adopted uh, Messiah, uh, that Jesus was the Messiah. He was a perfect atonement. Uh, they revered James but rejected Paul. And they lasted all the way up until when? And that's, that's about the time the Crusades started. Yeah. So either they were killed by the... Uh, I'm sorry? Yeah. Just one quick question. What do these early groups think about the resurrection if they don't believe he was... Well, most of them believed in the resurrection. They believed he was the perfect atonement, and that's why we could have the resurrection. A very good question, because we'll talk about the resurrection next week, about the effects of that. That's a very, very good question. The Nazarene questions basically believe the same thing as the Edenites, except they believe in the virgin birth. This is one of their, um, this is one of their tombstones. It's about this big, you know, and they found a whole bunch of these Nazarene tombstones. Notice it's got the mark of the cross on it. They were, they were Christians, but they only used the Aramaic the Aramaic Gospel of Hebrew, and they did reject Paul. They also were wiped out by the Crusades. Marcionite Christians, these are kind of, it's kind of bad, but it was very, very popular during, during the first, second century. Uh, Marcy made the first canon. He believed that Jesus was the divine Savior. Paul was revered, but, but Marcionites rejected anything Jewish. And they believed that God was really two people. They believed there were two gods. They believed there was an evil God, kind of like, not as bad as Satan, but the evil God was the God of the Old Testament. He was the demon. He's the one that went in and said, kill every man, woman, and child in that city, you know. So, you know, they said, how could a good, loving God like Jesus do something like that? So they believed the God of the Old Testament was the demon, which was a bad God, and that the whole purpose of Jesus, who came from the good God, was to release us from this horrible world created by the bad guy. Very strange belief. Uh, very similar to Gnostic belief, but he came only on his own. And they lasted to about 400 uh, AD. The Elohim Christians were basically like us, except for one thing. They rejected the book of John. They uh, said, we're not going to uh, have, have the book of John because we think it's too Gnostic. Gnostics in general, they believed in the secret knowledge that they had about Christianity and that God reveals to you how to escape this evil world. Uh, there's many, many different types of Gnostics. Uh, Valencians had their gospel of truth. They had a secret knowledge and they believed that they had the secret keys to, 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 to salvation. We're going to go through these pretty fast. The, Mac the Manichaean Gnostics, well, the only thing I'd like to point out about this is they started here mainly among the, the soldiers, but it spread here, here, here in the 11th century, all the way out here to the 1600s. This form of Gnosticism spread slowly all the way to China, and we didn't know about this until many, many years later, so it's kind of interesting. The Syrian uh, Egyptian Gnostics uh, believed that Jesus was just spirit. This is a picture of Salvador Dali that you can kind of see Jesus looks like, just a spirit. And he didn't really appear in, in flesh. And so as a result, um, because uh, earthly stuff is just too evil, and uh, we seem, they hate, seem to have had many scriptures as, this, as uh, indicated by the Nag Hammadi Library in 1945. Aryan Christians, probably the majority, uh, probably in the second century, probably, uh, they, they were orthodox, except they believed that Jesus, although he was God, was subordinate to the Father. They would read scriptures like this. If you love me, uh, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Well, if God and Jesus are equal, how can the Father be greater than I? Is what their argument was. Uh, but there's many other scriptures that you can point to to show that they're, they're equal. This is what we all are. We're all Trinitarians. All of us today pretty much are Trinitarians. We believe that uh, God is defined, uh, we find God as, as uh, one God in three persons, distinct, coexist in unity, they're co-equal, co-eternal, consubstantial. Now the New Testament doesn't ever use the word trinity to describe it, but it does have verses that, that support the like, you know, Great Commission, go and teach in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you know, pretty, pretty good evidence, right? But Constantine had a strong influence of selling this, this particular story. Constantine, I don't know how much, um, yeah, uh, Constantine, he basically, 
I don't know if you know the story of Constantine, but he was very important in the development of the church because he saw Christianity as a uniting force for the Roman Empire. He wasn't as much interested in Christianity as he was the effect it could have in him consolidating the empire. Because remember, before him, it had been divided up into four parts. He was trying to reunite it again. And he called for the Council of Nicaea to help unite the Christians, called bishops from all over the world. I mean, every church they knew about, they called the bishops in. Not all of them came, but he, he went. Uh, they went and they decided on the Trinity as the, as the uh, way we would go. He financed Bibles and churches. He was a major uh, uh, factor in the predominance of the orthodoxy. Y'all understand what I mean when I say orthodox? I don't mean Greek orthodox or something like that. I'm talking about the conservative view that, that Christians have of what the Trinity is. That's an orthodox view, that, that kind of thing. I want to make sure everybody understands that. And he continued to worship Apollo but, uh, the whole time and was baptized shortly before his death. Okay, what were the standards used for inclusion in the canon? Let's look at that. First one, apostolic. It had to be attributed to or based on the teaching of a first generation apostle or their close companions. Liturgical use, it had to be read in early communities. When Acceptance among the churches, used by major Christian communities in the ancient world. And orthodox and consistent message. Does it contain a theology similar to and not conflict with other Christian writings? All right. But who applied those standards? And which ones did you give more weight to? I mean, you can take those standards, and we're going to see an example of it today. Because today, you are going to get to decide whether or not to, this, to add a book to, the, to our current scripture. Here's why. The Apostle Andrew, how many of you remember that the Apostle Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, son of John or Jonah, he preached, according to the Apostolic Fathers, along the Black Sea, the Volga, Kiev, and Novgorod. He is the patron saint of the Ukraine, Romania, and Russia. He, he established churches all up around the Black Sea and was finally martyred uh, right about here, um, uh, about after he established... Uh, a church here in Istanbul, which became Constantinople, and selected the bishop there. He was actually crucified right down here in the Peloponnese. But there's rumor has it, a rumor now, that scholars have uncovered the Gospel of Andrew from AD, AD that was from these churches up in here. And the reason we didn't know about it before is after uh, Thomas uh, set up, I mean, I'm sorry, after Andrew set up these churches all up in here, they're all up here in Russia, Scythia, all up through here, the Dacians got very strong and cut off uh, any communication between the Greeks who they hated and the Romans who they hated from here, that is, the, the Romans. They did not like, and so they cut off any communication. So these churches all were left to themselves. And then, by about 300 A.D., the Huns came in and killed them all. So all these Christians were killed, okay? And they didn't have any communications with these, these people down here. Now, uh, several copies, uh, it's rumored that several copies of, the, uh, of this gospel has been found in Christian graves that carbon dated to about 80 AD. The letters, there's letters there that claim they were written by the Apostle Andrew, and they were clearly used in churches there that, that Andrew set up. These Christians cut off, uh, were cut off and lasted to about 300 AD until they were wiped out by the Huns. Now, this gospel, now this is what I want you to pay attention to because you've got to make a decision whether we should include this gospel in our canon. Okay? I'm going to tell you what the gospel says according to the rumors. This gospel includes these things found in our gospel. Feeding the 5,000, walking on water, many of the events in the Passion area. The entry into Jerusalem, the portrayal by Jesus, novel Peter, arrest, the Pilate's trial, crucifixion, and the resurrection. Very important parts. But Andrew omits very major parts of Jesus' ministry. It's very, very different. There's no virgin birth or mention of Bethlehem or flight to Egypt. There's no lad at the temple. There's no baptism by John the Baptist. He sees John the Baptist, but isn't baptized in him. Doesn't have Dove come down and say, this is my son, and all that stuff. There's no temptation in the desert in this book. You know how when Jesus, uh, when Jesus is, is, is baptized, he goes into the desert and is tempted by the devil? That story's not in here. Jesus never tells a parable. 
There's no kingdom of God returning. He never mentions that the kingdom of God is returning. He does far fewer miracles in the book of Andrew. Jesus never casts out a demon. There is no Mount of Transfiguration. You know, that's a very important story in, all the, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They, 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 they tell it at length about um, how uh, Moses and Elijah appear and they're going to build a tabernacle and they say, this is, God appears, this is my son. And Jesus said, don't tell anybody what you saw until after I'm dead. Okay? That's not important. <clears throat> Jesus does not attempt to keep his identity secret in this book as, as opposed to the synoptics, for example. Uh, there's no institution of the Lord's Supper. There's no Garden of Gethsemane and the blood, uh, bloody, uh, 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 bloody sweat uh, that Jesus went through. And there's no trial by the Sanhedrin. It's just Pontius Pilate and the Romans that do it. And there's other things. This gospel includes some things not found in our current gospels. Jesus performs seven new miracles. It's not in any of the other gospels. The first miracle is very, very different. Than the, than, the, than the ones that we have. He actually raises one of the apostles' brothers from the dead. His sermons are long. They're somewhat mystical discourses, and he never tells a parable. They go long and long and long. Last Supper is near a Passover meal, and Jesus and Pilate converse longer at trial. So let's go to the next one. Do we include this in the canon or not? What well, does it have apostolic origin? Well, we got pretty good proof of that, don't we? It's, it's right there in the graves of these people. Does it have liturgical use? Yes. I mean, it was used by all those churches up there. Does it have acceptance among the churches? Well, it was certainly accepted among the churches that were cut off. You can't really expect to be accepted by the churches down here in Greece and in Asia Minor and those places because they, they were cut off by the Dutchies. But is it orthodox and consistent? Now that's where we have a little bit of rub here, don't we? Think about all the basic things in, in his ministry that aren't included there, right? So this Bible, this thing here, uh, called the Gospel of Andrew, based on that evidence, would you, everybody here that's in favor of including the book of Andrew in our canon, raise your hands. We have two people. It could be because they don't know enough like I don't. Yeah, I understand, I understand. But let's say that everything I said is what we have. Well, I wouldn't include it either. Um, just simply because I think it's got it's too different from our current ones. But you're very brave souls, I like that. Because you're the only ones that aren't going to be declared a heretic. And here's the reason. And this, this little trick was pulled on me by a professor when I was in college taking this same course. There is no new book of Andrew, okay? This exercise, the majority of us have here just decided to exclude the Gospel of John when compared to the synoptics. And I was like, my professor did that, and I just go, what? <laughs> this exercise is used to uh, illustrate the difficulty that early Christians, like the theologians had, who had Matthew, Mark, and Luke, mm -hmm. but then someone brings in the book of John and says, you have to take this. And they go, what? And let's take a look. Because the book of John omits all of these things that we talked about. It doesn't have the virgin birth in it or Bethlehem. It doesn't have the land of the temple. It doesn't have the baptism by John. There's no temptation of the desert. There's no parables. There's no kingdom of God returned. There's far fewer miracles. Jesus never cast out a demon. There's no amount of transfiguration. He goes around telling everybody about who he is. Totally different than what Mark is. There's no institution of the Lord's Supper where he says, do this in remembrance of me. There's no vicinity. There's no trial of the Sanhedrin. He does have a lot of things like this. Feeding the 5,000, the events of uh, walking on the water, passion narrative, the entry into Jerusalem, and he has two entries into Jerusalem. The trail by Jesus, the Nile, and Peter, arrest, Pilate's trial, crucifixion, and resurrection are the two most important things. But he also performs seven new miracles that aren't in the, in the Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, the first miracle is changing water into wine. That's one of the things theologians had a hard time with. They said, you know, he's, the first one, he, in Mark, he casts out demons. And you've got him changing water into wine. We have a hard time with that, you know. So um, they have a, you know, it doesn't say that they're necessarily mutually exclusive, but um, uh, Jesus could have performed the miracle that came before casting out the demons. Just it wasn't listed there. So uh, Jesus raises the disciples, brother, from the dead. I might have tricked you a little bit on this. This is Lazarus. Uh, you know, Lazarus is not mentioned in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. 
And that's a pretty big deal, raising one of the uh, uh, Marian family. The sermons are long and somewhat mystical. Last Supper is near Passover, but it's not a Passover meal. And Jesus and Pilate converse quite long at trial. Um, so the Elogian Christians were faced with this dilemma. They accepted the Synoptic Gospels, but not the Gospel of John. Being a heretic may be easier than you think. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this was an exercise, really. The reason for the exercise is to help, help us all understand this reason it was done on me in college was to help us understand the difficulty that some of these things, issues, that early Christians dealt with. They were well-meaning people, um, but um, you know they, they had to wrestle with some of these issues. Next week, we'll talk about who applied these standards and decided which books were canonical and what effect. This is really interesting. What effect? This is probably the most interesting part of this series, is what effect did the excluded books have on the New Testament, have on Christianity. So thank you very much. I'm sorry. <laughs>